So I'd like to introduce interested thumbs up. <laughs> cool. I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Our panel discussion is Black History Month, past, present, and future. And we have some five incredible panelists tonight. Um, this is very small, um, <laughs> so you don't aren't expected to read it. We have Mr. Kevin Spencer Beckford. Kevin Spencer Beckford, he, him, his, is an internationally recognized operations executive, change agent, and anti-racist strategist, and executive servant leader with experience working in the for-profit and nonprofit sector. Kevin is currently serving as SVP, Health Care Systems and Chief People Officer at Great Health Inc., a healthcare technology company. Prior to that, Kevin was Senior Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the U of R. In his role, Kevin provided anti-racist equity strategies and direction to assist the U of R in achieving more equitable and inclusion culture for its 32,000 employees. Welcome, Kevin, we're so happy to have you. Our second panelist is Mr. Vincent I. French, he, him, his, CAS, MAT, serves as the coordinator of equity and inclusivity for the Pittsburgh Central School District, an inaugural district level position he began on November 15th, 2021. As the coordinator of equity and inclusivity, Mr. French assists with the planning, leading, and supporting of best practices as they relate to restorative practices at the classroom, building, and district levels. Supports the continuous learning and professional development of staff in the area of equitable and inclusive instructional practices. Assists with the district's ongoing effort to attract, recruit, and retain a diverse and highly effective faculty and staff. And assists with the evaluation and selection of high quality curriculum and instructional materials that supports all students' growth and opportunities to learn. Thanks for coming tonight, Vincent. Um, then we've got Dr. April Acock. She, her, hers is a licensed mental health counselor and master's level credentialed alcohol, alcoholism substance abuse counselor. She holds an educational doctorate in executive leadership from St. John Fisher University. Dr. Acock has served in a variety of professional leadership roles, including consultant, presenter, clinical supervisor, clinical coordinator, psychiatric emergency evaluator, group facilitator, private practice therapist, and adjunct professor. We also have Keisha, Ms. Keisha James, she, her, hers, um, master's in education, licensed marital family therapist, is an educational leader, licensed marriage and family therapist, and co-director of the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project, who values authenticity, growth, and justice. She provides individuals and organizations with opportunities to amplify their communication, connection, and confidence so they can make an influential impact on their world. And I believe we might have one more panelist joining us in a little bit. So I'm going to save that bio for later. Thank you all so much for meeting with us today. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone who's, um, who's here um, as, as viewers as well. Um, tonight, we're going to dig into a little history, um, asking one of our panelists to share. But um, if others want to jump in with any historical knowledge, they're welcome to. Um, because the past matters and awareness of it can help us guide our future actions. Then we're gonna step into the present and hear from each panelist, hear what they're doing in their, in their present day as, as change makers. And then we're gonna end by looking to the future. So starting with the past, um, when Pittsburgh grew from 6,000 to 25,000 people, deed and covenant restrictions and exclusionary zoning laws made property values high and made it too expensive for people to access. Vast majority of African Americans are still holding these lower paying jobs and the ability to buy a house here reinforces that stereotype um, that we don't belong. Keisha James, your role as co-director of the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project has given you a great amount of knowledge on the local history and historical harms, as well as those standing up against that harm and making change. Would you share for a few minutes with those who may not yet know about the history that occurred here? Absolutely. And Annalise, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, so I'm going to just start in um, a little bit more uh, current times. When I say current, I'm thinking about the last 100 years or so. And um, I want to just start with Monroe County Legislator. And so um, Annalise just talked a little bit about the ra racially restrictive covenants um, that were put on hundreds of homes and thousands of homes actually within our community. And I'm just going to share a screen in just a second so I can... I don't know about you all, but I'm very visual. So definitely wanna share this with you all. All right, 
So this right here is a current map of all of the racially restrictive covenants that we um, currently have found so far um, that are still in or on deeds um, to this day. They're no longer enforceable. Um, but in the between the 20s and 30s, 20s and 40s, um, Munners County legislator, they voted to put whites only deeds on hundreds of suburban homes. The legislator from Pittsburgh actually voted in favor of this. Developers in Pittsburgh put whites only covenants on homes um, in the East Avenue estates, as well as neighborhoods directly across from Pittsburgh Sutherland High School. Um, and definitely, if you are interested in learning a little bit more, this website right here on the top um, will share a little bit to you. And so when we pull out from Monroe County and go a little bit more um, federal, when we think about what are the policies that were in place at this time um, that actually helped to create these racially restrictive covenants um, that actually impacted everyone in our community. And so um, over this time period of a course of over 30 to 40 years, the federal government, they offered $119 billion in mortgage insurance to over 35 million families. 98% of those families were white. Uh, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of that law to help you get just get an understanding of what actually created these deeds that we're seeing here. And so you may have seen these redlining maps around before. Um, and maps were part of the issue, but they weren't the biggest problem. They weren't the biggest issue here. You'll see that there are four different colors that Monroe County was um, coded in. And again, this isn't uh, this isn't unique to Rochester. This truly is something that happened in every major city across the United States. And so some neighborhoods are rated best and they got um, green or blue labels. Um, even the ones that were yellow that were labeled definite declining, the government would actually insure mortgages in these areas. But the areas that were considered red or hazardous, they couldn't get federal investment. And I just wanna show just a few pieces of what actually made an area considered hazardous and not um, worthy of government investment. So this is just a, some language. It says, prediction may be made regarding the possibility of the location being invaded by such groups. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in value. So again, this is the law that created that map that I was just showing you. Um, and part of the rules for that map was to put racially restrictive covenants on deeds. Another piece of this is thinking about natural or artificially established barriers will prove effective in protecting a neighborhood and the locations within it from adverse influences, including the prevention of, of the infiltration of business and industrial uses, lower class occupancy, and inharmonious racial groups. When we think about homes, Prohibition should be made um, for properties except by the race for which they are intended. And even when you think about schools, they said, you know, the social class of parents of a school will in many instances have direct bearing. Thus, physical surroundings of a neighborhood may be favorable and conducive to enjoyable, pleasant living in its location. However, if the children of people living in such an area are compelled to attend school where the majority or a considerable number of pupils represent a far lower level of society or an incompatible racial element, the neighborhood under consideration will prove far less stable and desirable than, this, than if this condition did not exist. So when we think about this, these, these words in this language that's actually put into law that helped to create the suburbs across our United States. They are really re letting people know who was welcomed and who wasn't. This became illegal um, in the 1960s. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act was passed. And so what happened was um, many suburbs, Pittsburgh included, they decided to increase lot sizes and outlaw duplexes and apartment buildings. Um, Joe Wilson and Robert Rhodes, one of the first Black folks that lived in Rochester, Joe Wilson, he was the president of Xerox. They fought against this in the 60s, against the exclusionary zoning practices, and they lost. Um, and what we know is that today, those still those policies, those exclusionary zoning practices and policies are still in place, um, impacting what we're seeing um, in our current times. And I would love to share more of this with you. And I know that there's other folks that have to speak, so I'll stop right there um, and turn it back over to Annalise. So thank you. Thanks so much, Keisha. Um, and I know I um, asked you to share because of that super important anti-racist curriculum project that you're involved in and um, how that is going to help educate our youth, because a lot of us um, growing up in this area didn't know these things occurred. And when you don't know your past, you can't really address things in the present. Um, I just want to uh, open it up if any other panelists wanted to share anything else about the past that they um, they had on in their mind you could you could do so now or we could move on to the present 
Um, I'd love to uh, unleash here because to me this was so relevant to my time serving on the town board. Um, and, and actually it governs a lot of what I do today. And, and one of the reasons why I decided not to stay on the town board was because it was clear to me that what, what Keisha just described, um, most of our people that live in Pittsburgh didn't know that. Um, they didn't understand it. Uh, they didn't understand the ramifications of it. So what, you know, so the, the narrative today around, in fact, when you, you think about what she showed you in terms of the intent it was pretty explicit. It wasn't sort of like warm and fuzzy, not sure what we mean. It was pretty clear. We do not want African-Americans living here and we wanna make sure it's codified. Uh, one could argue that is the epitome of social engineering. We socially engineered um, laws to prevent and to keep out and exclude African-Americans. Now, it became a little bit less um, acceptable to say that as things progressed, right? The civil rights bill was passed and, you know, Martin Luther King was killed. And so it became a little bit, you know, we need to be a little bit more covert with our language. And so exclusionary zoning laws um, was a very creative, not a very precise way to say we will create a socioeconomic barrier so we can't say we wanna keep black people out, but what we do know is as a society, they're prevented from getting access to higher paying jobs. So if I put up a new fence, that's a financial fence, I can pretty much accomplish the same ends. It's imprecise because it affects poor white people. And it, it affects any human being that can't afford those prices. And so, so when you think about well, if people under, don't understand why that happened, what we did, what we're still doing, what I tried to do in my term on the town board to create change by saying, let's introduce, and if you go back and look at the language of my amendment, inclusionary zoning laws on a remaining land that's left to be built on. It's already approved, so no, no, no discussion there. Uh, but today it's exclusionary zoning laws. If we replace some of the inclusionary zoning laws, it opens up the door for higher density housing, <clears throat> like the ones that were excluded, that are automatically brings entry level point for housing in those areas to much more reasonable prices for all human beings. But because of the fear of knowing that, oh my gosh, if we do that, what we did years ago is gonna be undone. I essentially was trying to socially engineer a solution to counteract what was done by someone sitting in the very seat I was in. And our family had to deal with death threats as a result of that, which tells you something. I mean, it, it means that there's an emotional content still left in Pittsburgh. People who live here today, not in the 50s, not in the 30s, not in the 20s, in 20, you know, 19, that feel so strongly about not opening the doors for all human beings that look like me and everybody on this screen here that's, that's African-American, that, that has such a strong feeling, they were willing to put my family's life at risk. That's the, I mean, that's who we are, I mean, I, I live here. And so to me, to, to sit on the town board recognizing that there were people in our midst driving past my house, who I see in the store in Wegmans, passing by in the food and the dairy aisle, would feel that strongly about it, tells you the work that we have to do. So for me, it was very little bit use of me being on the town board because for Democrats, they wanted to have someone in that seat. For me, I wanted to figure out how could I use the position for an agency of that role to undo what was done before I got here, only to find out that I could not. It's because the people that live here in Pittsburgh that said they came here, and I'll use a Republican quote to keep the character of Pittsburgh, we need to attract the right kind of diversity. That is 2023 language that is literally identical to what Keisha just showed you, keep black people out. But that's the new way of saying it. And so education to me is paramount. If we wanna create change in any of these suburbs and specifically to Pittsburgh as we talk about it, we have to educate as many people as we can 
so that they can get behind this change. And instead of standing by silently while the change agent tries to create change, they will get behind them. Um, so I'll stop there. I was, so I oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so I, I just wanna add a little bit of perspective um, in relation to mental health and um, some physical health and addiction, um, if I may real quick. So just wanted to really point out that in the early um, 1800s, African-Americans were considered biologically inferior um, by physicians as well as psychiatrists. Um, and one in particular where you can still find his literatures and articles that's been published, which is Samuel Cartwright. And, you know, um, he is a doctor and um, he published multiple things that enslaved people who wanted to run. Um, it was actually a diagnosis in the DSM and, or at least diagnosable, I should say. And um, the cure, it was curable is what they said. So if you wanted to run because you did not want to be enslaved, um, the cure for it would be either whooping the person or amputating the person's foot. So again, because we didn't want to be enslaved, this is what was considered. And then of course, we've had individual talk about, you know, the Jim Crow, um, there's different documents and literature on just how um, inhumane um, African-Americans were treated um, all in the name of science, um, or it was just a couple of them. Um, we can fast forward it, because um, I know just for the sake of time, in 1971, you have the whole war on drugs, and now you have it now, it's the um, opiate epidemic and we want treatment. Um, I find it very interesting that um, most people think that the opiate epidemic started really in 1990s or 2000s, and actually Black and Hispanic population have been dying for years um, with it, and actually it started during the post-war. Um, Narcan was available during that time as well, more intravenous and within um, intermuscle as well. Um, I do want to point out that the American Psychiatric Association finally did issue an apology and stated that um, they apologized for the years of inhumane treatment experiments, experiments, whitewashing practices, um, intentional excluding Black pioneer psychiatrists uh, within the academic and clinical practices um, just to maintain the power and the privilege. So I find that very interesting. Now let's fast forward it now because we wonder why most um, African-Americans don't trust the mental health system as a whole. Um, I gave you some of that information, but when we look into just overall, the National Institute of Mental Health stated that 52.9 million people are suffering from mental health. And out of that number, um, it is 51.8% are whites and 37.1% are blacks and Hispanic 20.8%. When we go further in, we look at it and we see that within the United States, if an African-American enters um, into treatment and I'll say BIPOC, you know, because um, I don't want to exclude anyone, but when they enter treatment, they're either fail or um, don't um, continue in treatment at all. So these are some things that the Surgeon General also stated that racism is a public health issue. Um, and when you look at the DSM, you, you know, DSM-5, you see that it has trauma in there, but it still does not talk about racialized trauma, although racialized trauma has a physical effect on it as well. So I'll stop there. I just wanted to kind of highlight that when we talk about, you know, um, the structure and the power and the control, it goes so far, you know, housing and different practices and medical and mental health and education, and it just goes on and on and on. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Acock, um, Kevin and Keisha for sharing some of that history. Um, we're gonna shift to the present now. Um, you know, present day, each of our panelists is, you know, in their fields doing amazing things. Um, so we're going to just turn over to each of you just to kind of share a little bit about what you're doing today in the present. Um, you know, Kevin, you're up first. I know you already changed, shared a little bit about the recent town board experiences. Would you mind to share a little bit about what you're doing with your cup of change these days? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in fact, for me, um, when I decided not to run again, um, it was about halfway through. Um, so I had two more years left. So I started planning what I want to do um, with my time. 
And it was really to focus on education, you know, um, and also to kind of shift a little bit of my resources towards the inner city and Monroe County, um, and particularly in the inner city in terms of trying to create some change. Uh, and I decided to really relegate my, my resources as it relates to Pittsburgh to education primarily. That's primarily what I do now. I'm not going to get involved with government. I'm not going to get involved with, because I discovered that really won't do anything if the vast majority of people don't even know our history. And so, you know, the Martin Luther King series is one of the things I started four years ago. I want to thank the Pittsburgh community, um, the nonprofit, new nonprofit in Pittsburgh that's adopted that program. So it'll kind of live on in perpetuity. And it's basically a month of January, not just celebrating Martin Luther King, that's probably only 20% of it, 80% of it is education, bringing people together to create an emotional event or educational event, and then asking them to figure out what, what do you do now that you, if you learn something that you didn't know. So if you think about what Keisha just shared, that's a snippet of what this entire anti-racism program is. So just imagine what really excites me and I'm on the advisory council uh, for that project is because we are now have just about every school district with the exception of about three or four, I believe, that have teachers that are now teaching that at the elementary appropriate and middle school and high school level. So all age appropriate. And it's basically not teaching a direction or a doctrine, like what some of the critics will say. It's about basically what you saw there, source material, saying, here's where we said no black people. Here's where we said, fill in the blank. And so it's educating kids on what, what really happened. My wife grew up here in Pittsburgh. I remember when I met her 25 years ago, she says, I don't know why I never saw a black person in my neighborhood until 1971. We literally did not know until I read The Color of Law, until I started talking to people to say, by the way, that house that you were living in has a deed restriction, your entire neighborhood outside of Oak Hill, the entire neighborhood. So no black people until 1968. So that's why she didn't know. Graduated from Sutherland, went off to college, came back, visited her grandparents in the same room, but had no idea. So to me, education to me, gives us an opportunity as human beings to, to understand what we did, what we're still doing, and then it poses the question to you, what are you gonna do now? And so to me, I'm excited about the fact that our school kids will start to learn this history. And I believe that ultimately they will figure out what their cup of change is. And so for me, as it relates to Pittsburgh, it's one thing, education. I'm not gonna spend any more of my time, effort, resources, time, talent, or treasure for anything other than educating as many people that live in Pittsburgh to know what we did, what we're still doing, and then I'm gonna leave it to them to figure out what to do. I'm not even gonna tell them. Because it's up to them. All of my efforts, time, talent, treasure, it's about the young people in the city, homelessness, housing insecurity, food insecurity, because that is where I really want to spend most of my time outside of the education for people who live in Pittsburgh. And, and for me, it gives me a chance to take a sizable chunk of, of what I can do in a reasonable way to hopefully affect long-term change. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for your, your service in our town. And speaking of you know, Pittsburgh, as a Pittsburgh PTSA, we're focused on Pittsburgh schools, understandably so. Um, there's been some progress over the past few years. You know, your wife was the co-chair of this committee that we we're meeting on years ago, right? And this committee coming to fruition was progress. Um, and having the first administrators in the past two years of color that we know of hired is progress, including um, the first black admin who's our guest tonight, right? Mr. Vince and I French. Um, there's also a huge increased focus on DEI, right? On the inside and the outside. Um, so Vincent, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for your work um, and your dedication to, to Pittsburgh as a resident, as a, you know, as a parent and as an employee. Um, tell us about your role and your contributions here. You're on mute. Got to unmute, sorry, Vincent. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I apologize. Um, 
Uh, at first, I just want to acknowledge the fact um, that you have me part of this panel. Thank you so much for that, as well as the uh, hard work that um, many, of, many of you on this panel and just in the community in general um, have done in support of this work and DEI and pushing Pittsburgh forward. Um, again, much of that hard work, if, if not all of it, um, was geared towards the, the establishment and creation of, of this uh, role. So again, thank you for all those that have continued to push um, to have this role um, be here, um, but then also continue to um, come to the table to support the work of um, making Pittsburgh more inclusive and uh, diverse. Um, but it's no secret that um, the education for, for BIPOC students are, um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, in a, it's in a situation where they're experiencing significant uh, disparities in, in, in the education opportunities and the, and the outcomes. Um, you know, and so here in Pittsburgh, one of the things that we're doing is continuing to elevate student voice. And that is something that's been done across the nation as well. Um, because it's important, one thing that we've heard and that we've seen here, especially in the media and in the news, um, is student voice and students not feeling uh, heard or seen or valued. Um, before I started here, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we had a walk right, that made the news, that made international news. I wouldn't even say international news, uh, where I had people in Jamaica, you know, um, uh, commenting on the walkout. Um, but that was all born out of the frustration of, of parents and, and, and community members and students, again, not feeling heard, not, not feeling seen. Um, and that, you know, the best efforts of the district um, were, were not speaking to or addressing the actual concerns of uh, the ones that were being impacted, you know, our BIPOC students, students of color. Um, and so um, here in the district, again, much of our work has been elevating student voice, but also addressing and repairing um, racial harm, right? Um, and that can be difficult in that, you know, there's different parameters that we, that we have to jump through to, to, to uh, be able to ensure that we are um, meeting the needs of all students that are, that are involved, but also ensuring that we're giving information, the correct, the, the correct information to um, you, the parents, um, and the community members so that, um, Everything is transparent, so it, it, you know everything's on the up and up. That we are ensuring that, um, you know, because that that's part of the trust process, right? As far as transparency goes, and so in supporting our students and being able to ensure that their voices are heard, and much of that work is being done um, and has been done initially before I started, um, but continue to uh, spearhead that work, looking at our hiring and our retention practices, how we are how we are working to bring more um, representation. Right, so I started out here. Um, my efforts in, uh, led me into, into bringing um, uh, Miss uh, Linda Myers Dickey uh, as assistant principal, another student, another administrator of color here, the first Black uh, female administrator of color in, in, in the district, um, who also was my teacher growing up. And I was in Edison Tech. Uh, she taught social studies, so I think it's global. Um, so I'm glad to have her here as well. But um, and then also looking at again, just initiatives to, to incorporate student voice. So we had the Rocket Change uh, Club. Um, the Rocket Change Club was born out of the work of, um, well, it was already around, but then one of the things that the districts across the, the region here uh, committed to was supporting that work. And there was a letter that, that was signed um, as part of the work to ensure that they were gonna support, that all districts were gonna support um, the Rocket Change. And so Rocket Change has these summits every school year, uh, twice per school year in the fall, and then also in the spring, wintertime, springtime, um, in which they meet as a collective, but then they bring the information back to the respective schools and respective school communities. Um, here in Pittsburgh, one thing that students have been doing is going to those summits, um, but then bringing that information back and turning key it to their high schools, connecting down to the middle schools, and now they started this year pushing into the elementary schools as well. Um, just last week, they were at um, Allen Creek, where they uh, presented information to the students there. Um, which also helped in, in getting students uh, looking at teaching as well. So that was a kind of like a, like a twofer. Um, but then also in connection with that, it's the community work and the community impact. Um, and so um, I was happy to be able to, um, in partnership with Mr. Be sorry, in partnership with Mr. Beckford as well, um, be able to um, point their attention to Tom Walls uh, here in, in Bushnell Basin. Um, and so um, we were able to connect with them. We have the upcoming. Um, session will be coming down March 7th, and we'll be looking at the uh, pictures in Tom Walls and be able to identify and select key pictures in which we can then um, replace with more pictures that are, uh, or newer pictures that reflect the, the diversity of Pittsburgh, uh, that, that are more diverse. And so we are very proud to be able to do that. Um, one of the pictures that we are hanging up and that the students of our change were able to speak to was um, 
who some, who some believe is the first black female teacher in the district was Sally Covington. Um, and it's, it's timely for me in that um, I, I wasn't aware, I was always trying to figure out, but there's no way that I can Google this or like, you know, look through our, um, our database for, for teachers, but um, Sally Covington is believed to be the first black female teacher here, here in the district working from 1967 to 1997 uh, due to her retirement. Um, and, and so, yes, I'm, I'm just, just still the questions that it is tough to look. I was in there actually the other day and I saw two, two uh, students that were from the high school working there. And I told them, I said, you know, we're coming here, you know, next week or in two weeks. She said, oh yeah, yeah, I heard, I heard, I'm really excited. I can't wait to see the work that you, that, 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 that you all do because this is not the move, you know? And, and it's not, and it's not, you know, while, while those pictures um, are important because there's legacy there, but it's important to, cap, to, to, to um, show the legacy of all the, of all the individuals that make up the Pittsburgh community. And so, you know, we're definitely looking for the things work, but one of the things that we're trying to hang up there is a picture of Sally Covington. Um, and I just thought how, how great it would be to walk in that establishment and see someone that looks like me, to also see someone um, that, that had a, such a, a long impact, 30 years, 30 years in Pittsburgh, right? In 1967, she started, right? When, right when the civil rights movement was, was gaining momentum, right? During a time when um, in the early 80s and 90s, when, when the educational reform was happening, she was here, right? Teaching, teaching Black literature and, and pushing her students, her white students, to appreciate Black literature because Black literature is American literature. It's a part of, it's part of our history. And so, um, you know, in her obituary, I was looking at her obituary and just seeing the, just the people extolling her virtues. You know, people, people uh, all the, her former students extolling her virtues of how wonderful she was and how tough she was. Um, and so um, it, it, it provided me with, um, with, with a sense of pride, knowing that she was here doing the work, but then also it's her shoulders that I stand on, right? It's her shoulders um, that, I, that I continue to do this work that made way for me, right? And so that's something that I am thankful for. Um, then also just to be able to see the impact of her role, even here in the district. We have some district personnel who went through Minden High School, and, and be, able to, be, be able to speak to um, their experiences as a student of Sally Clemens and that too. So, um, but, but, but you know, just moving on though, um, again, much of this work here in the district is continuing to elevate student voice, ensuring again um, that we're, that we're uh, addressing student harm in a meaningful, appropriate manner to ensure that um, communication around that harm um, is exact and that is transparent as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm I, I'm continuously just thinking about, um, you know, my son, right, and, and how he's continuously watching me, right, how he's continuously watching everyone around him, and, you know, those, those are things that, that continuously fuse me in my role, and those things that I continue to articulate when I'm in those places and spaces where um, other individuals in the community can't be, and so, so I, like, like, like Mr. Beckford says, like, it's important that I'm continuously leveraging my platform, uh, with however big or, or however small it may be, to ensure that our students' voices are heard. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned before getting hired when they asked me why I want a position, I said, representation matters. It matters to my son, students that look like me, but especially those that do not. And I, um, I ended up with a story of a student when I was at Alfred State College. Um, I was an RA, and it was a white student named Kedrin, who was from deep southern tier, like one stop like town kind of thing. And um, she, she, I remember past, uh, after the room selection time, she asked to have a, a black roommate. And so here, like, here, here we are now, two, three weeks after room selection time, I'm scrambling trying to find a roommate for her. And I place her with Myra Morrell, a young lady from section two of Co-op City in the Bronx. Um, when I asked her, like, I just asked her, why did you want a, a black roommate? Are we so avid about it? And she says, because, you know, I never met a black person in her life. What, what I know about black people is from, is from movies and TVs and, and, and media. At this time, it was, I think it was like Black Planet or Mahinte or, and Friendster. And it wasn't Facebook, so you didn't have that. You know, it wasn't like a well um, uh, surge of, of information in that respect. But during that time, for those two, three years that she was in that nursing program at Alfred, she wanted to ensure that she had that experience because she knew that when she went back home, she wasn't going to meet anyone like myself or like Myra. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, when I had a chance to talk to the, the, the district office about why I wanted to position, you know, it does matter. It matters to myself, to students that like me, it matters, but, but more importantly, it matters to students that don't like me because that's the education point that, that, um, 
that Kevin was speaking about, that um, Miss Becker was speaking about. And there we, and there we are, now, right? It's, it's ensuring that we're educating the future so that we are able to meet in the middle. Uh, and that's, that's really part of it. Thank you so much, Vincent. You're doing such great things and we wanna make sure that you're supported and you can keep doing this awesome work. Um, we're gonna segue to Dr. April Acock. Um, as someone who works in the mental health and, and medical field, um, would you share with us more about your role and what you're doing in the present day with your time and expertise? Yes, I'll try to go really quick because I know the time and I know other people need to um, also add their part, um, I do need to first start off because I am affiliated with, um, I wear a couple of hats. So I do want to say my opinions and thoughts are mine, not necessarily the opinion and thoughts of any of my, the individuals who I affiliate with. Um, so I do wear three hats. Um, the first hat, um, it is not in any particular order, but the first hat I wear is that I'm um, privileged enough to be an adjunct teacher. And so I work with um, graduate students who are entering into the counseling field. And in this role, I'm really able to see how they're working with clients and how they are, you know, able to look at the whole person in a holistic way. As I always tell everyone that mental health, um, addiction, and intellectual developmental disability does not discriminate. It touches all of us. Um, it also doesn't matter about your socioeconomic status either um, or your social determined status. It touches all of us. So I'm able to do that in that way so that they can continue to um, go out in the field and do some excellent work. So I'm privileged to do that. Um, I am uh, the first African-American. I do identify as African-American. So I'm the first African-American in Monroe County to be the Office of Mental Health Director for the county. Um, in law, my title is called the Director of Community Services. Um, and we oversee behavioral health services and we work with partners. We work with the state, we um, work with um, consumers of the system to see how we can improve it as well as maintain the services that we have. In this role, I'm also able to advocate on the state level. Again, looking at everyone, including our deaf and hard of um, hearing population, um, our LGBTQ plus population, um, and, and just all of the above. So it's just, it's very broad. Um, and in this, I'm also able to, um, was actually selected to be on the Multiculture um, New York State Office of Mental Health Committee. Um, and again, we'll look at some policies and procedures in that area. Um, so again, continuing to advocate for how we can um, ensure that um, our citizens is receiving um, services and treatment. Um, and I am also, um, I'm also, lastly, um, so I can sum it up real quick, I am also a prior practice um, therapist. And so I work with individuals who are, you know, dealing with just daily stressors, um, family discord, could be a work-related, mental health-related, addiction-related. Um, so I'm privileged to really work with people and um, hear where they're at and at their most vulnerable state, provide some support for um, individuals. Um, and I also work with individuals who are really struggling with racialized trauma as well. So that's a little bit of what I, I do. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Wow, that's amazing. That's many hats. <laughs> thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, Keisha, you, uh, would you like to share a little bit more about your current role um, in the present day and, and what you do? Sure. Uh, so currently I co-lead the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project, uh, where we've written uh, different units of study that focus on the local history of um, just our local history in Rochester. And I think that's what makes our curriculum a little bit different, um, is that everything is, is place-based. Um, and we are truly, everything is also inquiry-based. So we're never telling kids, you need to believe this, or you need to look at it this way or that way. We put primary sources, kind of like I gave you a little snippet of, um, which Kevin talked about in the beginning. We put them in front of kids and we ask them, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you think about this? And really importantly, what do you feel about this? We make space for students to have whatever feelings they have that are coming up here. We make space for them to ask questions. Um, and we help teachers realize that they don't have to be the gatekeepers of information. 
that they get to be a facilitator in the space that they also get to be learners with their students. Because like Kevin was saying, lots of folks, when we go in and we do trainings, we've trained over 10,000 folks in our community over the last couple of years. And every day we go in, folks are like, I never realized I, this existed. Um, I'm usually from adults, I'm embarrassed um, that I never knew that this happened in my community and you know, different feelings that are coming up and we're making space for that as well. Uh, and so our goal is really truly to teach students a little bit more perspective of our, our history and what's actually happened right here in our community, um, but to also highlight folks, every single day folks that faced injustices and stood up, um, because that's the thing, like, we're not asking students, you know, to be these, these civil rights leaders or different things like that. We're just asking them at the end of all of our units, what are the problems that you see in your community today, you know, and what do you want to do about it? You know, what do you feel empowered to do? And it doesn't have to have anything to do with racism. You know, we've had kids that have done stuff around bike lanes, about, you know, solar panels. And truly it's about, you know, what's important to you and how do we empower our students to realize that they don't have to have this, this huge power. They don't have, they can just be, they can still be agents of change. You know, they can still do something about the issues or problems that they see in their community. You know, one of the reasons that our project is a project is we had fourth grade students that came along and they said, you know what, we don't think it's fair. We think it's systemic racism that we don't have any teachers that look like us in Henrietta, you know, and they advocated and they did some research and they spoke to the principals and the school board and Henrietta changed their hiring practices because four nine-year-olds said, you know what, this is unfair and it's not okay, you know, and I deserve to have someone like you were saying, Vincent, like representation matters. It matters to see people who look like them um, and people who look different than them that have face things in the community and that are saying, you know what, I'm going to stand up against this. We're not trying to create a bunch of activists. We truly are just trying to empower students to realize that they have a stake, you know, in this community that we all love and we want to be, you know, as equitable as we can for our kids. And so I can go on forever because obviously I'm very passionate about it. Um, but really thinking about this and, and my background is I was an educator for about 14 years um, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. And so I've been doing this in my classroom with students for a very long time and really thinking about how am I supporting their mental well-being um, while also teaching them things that are truth and developmentally appropriate. And so I'd love to answer any questions that folks have or share our website um, if you'd like to learn more. So thank you all. So this was the, the point where we thought we could um, sort of have a little cushion of time for a little dialogue. If any folks had any questions they wanted to throw in the chat, or if I, any of you wanted to comment on something someone else shared or ask each other a question, um, we'll just uh, pause for a minute and um, give a little space for that. There is one question in the chat, um, and I believe this was when Vincent was speaking. Um, it says, what specifically do you mean by transparency? What kind of things do you think the district should be transparent about when it comes to racial issues? Thank you so much. I was gonna, I was being on whether to reply back to Pika, you know, firsthand or just do this for the group. But either way, but when I talk about transparency and communicating instances that arise in the school, um, means being open and honest about what happened, right? Why it happened and what actions are being taken to address the incident or situation. Um, right, it involves providing all the relevant information uh, to all the stakeholders, such as parents, um, students, and staff, in a timely manner, right? Um, I believe that transparency, well, I know that transparency is something that, that builds trust and confidence among the school community, and that's something that um, has continuously been echoed um, about the lack of trust, the lack of transparency, lack, the lack of trust, um, the lack of, of feeling safe uh, just because of our communication, the lack thereof. Um, and so I, I just continue to see, um, uh, think that it involves a level of transparency uh, because it can also help prevent rumors, right, and the misinformation from spreading. Uh, which can then cause further harm and, and damage uh, to the school reputation, um, to the families, but ultimately, the most important to the students, uh, because they're the ones that have to return back to that school environment, right? They're the ones that have to, um, you know, continuously face the ridicule of their peers um, and are continuously speculating, making jokes of situations. Then, at the root of that, there's actual real, real issues that need to be resolved there, um, both between the person that is inflicting the harm and the ones that are actually being harmed. Um, so when I talk about transparency, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Oh, any other thoughts before we, we move on to, oh, there we go. We got one. Um, 
Vincent and Keisha, how can we effectively advocate for the anti-racist curriculum project? Um, it would be incredible if Pittsburgh utilized it. I don't understand why we're not the first in line to sign up. Um, I can't speak necessarily too much to that point. I, I did meet with uh, Keisha. I had the pleasure of meeting with Keisha and Shane earlier on when I first started um, speaking about, and I, I've met them before just in general, but um, speaking more pointedly about the anti-racist curriculum. Um, it was my, my understanding with that initial meeting that there was conversation that they had prior with our, um, before I started with, um, with Melanie Ward uh, regarding that. Um, and I think that conversation is still ongoing. Um, yeah, I would say advocate, 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 reach out to whoever you can, um, send emails, call. <laughs> um, there definitely has, um, there were conversations, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, like Vincent said, we met earlier this year, um, but we are open and willing whenever Pittsburgh opens its doors. So as many folks as that can advocate as, as possible, um, we will come in and train one teacher, we will come in and train 5,000 teachers. You just let us know what you need. And I am, if, if I can add to as well, I, I, I serve on the advisory council for the anti-racism curriculum project. And one of the things that is really important for the, the, the mission of the project is that, you know, to where districts want this, right? They have to really want it. Um, so, so we don't, you know, in fact, when we're asked questions in a meeting that says, who didn't sign up yet? We purposely don't say that who, who that is. We want you to go to your district and ask. And the reason being is because we don't want this to be a push. We want this to be something where people want it. So one thing I would say as a potential recommendation, uh, and this could be a PTSA DEI initiative would be, you know, during the Martin Luther King um, uh, series that I put on uh, this uh, in January, the very first event was to have Keisha, James, Keisha and Shane's, you know, um, project that she, they share a small version of that. He basically kind of conducted like a mini class to show you the source material. So we were the students that day. And, and, and I got to tell you, and, and, you know, it was just very moving to, you know, it's one thing to see, we get the updates, but to be in the actual classroom, walking around, looking at the sheets that he had on the board. And I'm going like, I'm sorry, they had 20,000 enslaved people in New York state. Never seen that before anywhere. And then when we decided not to do that, it was gradual. It wasn't like, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna do it anymore. It's like over the next few years, you know? So it was like, it was very powerful. Uh, and to think that our kids are going through K through 12 today, not knowing some of that. You know, my wife said that there was one sentence about redlining. It didn't even say what the impact was. Like what, what, did, it do, what did it do to human beings? Not, not just who we excluded, that's bad. But the fact that by not being included, we had white kids growing up thinking that black people don't exist, only on TV, singing, playing basketball, or being arrested. That's what we did to the white kids here, right? And sadly, we still do it today because of the, what I mentioned earlier, I won't go into that. But the bottom line is that I believe what may be one potential, have DEI, PTSA host a session like what Shane did and invite all the parents, and I assure you they will come because some of them are nervous about critical race theory and all this other good stuff, you know, um, and just say, come, just come and kick the tires, listen and learn. And you will find out that all it is is basically truth. And then how that truth will eventually set us free from the, what we actually have today, which is a segregated town. You know, and, you know, I live here in Pittsburgh. I've been here for six years. I am reminded every day it's a segregated town. I would argue some of my white neighbors walk around going like, whoa, what a nice canal, period. Stop there. And so we want to educate folks to say, listen, this, this what we have today is some beauty to it, but there's some things that we're still doing. And the more we can educate, I think it may move people to say, I want something different. I'm not even telling, you know, to me at the end of the day, the truth will set us free from the biases that we have inside us that, that are filling in the blank that says it's this way because, you know? Um, and so I, I think that could be one potential good thing is this information is just powerful and it's pure. It's not a doctrine. 
It's just saying, you know, and you know, and I don't know if anybody saw the news today, you know, Scott Adams, who I used to love that Dilbert cartoon for years. I wish he was open and honest 30 years ago. Then I would know not to buy the stuff I bought. Like I'm, I'm looking at my house now to get rid of that stuff. Because he essentially is saying, we're not fully human. Like we're subhuman. That exists with us today simply because we don't have the education around what we did, what we're still doing, and what the possibilities might be to do something different. Thank you for sharing that, Kevin. Um, we're gonna transition to Joy um, and Tadaha. Thank you for fielding the next few questions. Of course, I get the joy part, which I love. Um, <laughs> it's always uplifting and fun. So um, as this is Black History Month, uh, we did want to take a few minutes to celebrate and acknowledge joy, right? Um, there's also joy in how we're able to still still celebrate despite true equity not being achieved. So some of the things that you know we've talked about um, in Pittsburgh is um, we've done the Pride March, we've done the MLK Living the Dream series as recent as in January. Um, so we want to offer each panelist a joy focused or celebration comment. So something that you know you are currently experiencing joy in or something that you're doing that's joyful for you, um, just to kind of be uplifting. So um, we can start with Dr. Agat. Okay, um, so I, I, I'm excited that I'm um, able to, year, years, years ago, it wouldn't have been heard of, but I'm so honored that I'm in the various positions that I'm in. And I find it a lot of joy to get to know people from a, a vast, you know, um, pool of intellect, as well as, you know, racial and social status and um, can really look at how we can impact people who are suffering from mental health. Um, as I stated earlier, mental health addiction and intellectual developmental disability doesn't care what you are. Um, and so, um, and so I, that brings me quite a bit of joy. I would say the other joy is that people are talking about um, the EI. They're talking about the BIPOC, the simple fact that the Surgeon General, you know, indicated that racism, I mean, who would have said that before, that racism is a public health issue? The fact that a matter that, you know, uh, look at what President, you know, Biden is doing. And, you know, there's so much that the state is doing, the governor is doing, and just the mere fact that people are saying that they need help now, and they're trying to reach out to get services. Um, we still have a long way to go, but it brings me joy to know that you know, I was able to participate in the 988 and people are utilizing, you know, the creation of 988 and people are utilizing that that number for, for crisis. So that brings me quite a bit of joy. And then personally, what brings me joy is I have two beautiful children um, that I love a lot. And I have started in 2023, really prioritizing my own self-care. So I that brings me quite a bit of joy. Thank you. And Dr. Ike, I just want to let you know that I was actually working at Rochester Regional when you were appointed and that brought me a lot of joy and I followed you on LinkedIn and I still do and it still brings me a lot of joy to see what you post. So <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like super excited that I was on this panel. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and moving on to my fellow friend, Keisha James, um, bringing back some marriage and family therapy memories. Here we go. <laughs> Um, so I would say, if I think about professionally, um, the, the things that bring me joy is that I get to do what I love. I get to do a, a mix of, I spent many years looking for what felt right, um, and searching and seeking. And I was a teacher, then I became a therapist, then I took some time off from teaching, then I was a coach. And then I went to school to be a principal. And I was like, no, this doesn't all, something's not right. And along came this project. And it just fit with everything that I was already doing. And I get to, cause my biggest thing was how do I blend these two things that I love which is education and mental health together. Like that has to be something that I do for, with my life. And so that truly does bring me joy. Um, and 
when I think about personally, like when I saw the question of what brings me joy, it's just, um, I think about my best friend uh, has been visiting and we just laughed yesterday, like one of those big belly laughs that I hadn't had in a long time. And I had one of the best donuts I've ever had in my life yesterday. So when I think about what brought me joy, <laughs> it was that laughter and that horchata donut. Oh, so good. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Tisha, I love what you're doing. You always, you know, it's just so proud getting knowing that I know you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Vincent, what brings you joy? Make sure my mic was on this time. Uh, one of the things that bring me joy uh, um, professionally is, is in this role, being able to see um, just the multitude of individuals um, every single day, parents, teachers, staff, uh, students, um, being able to see their humanity, um, having, having uh, seen their humanity, seeing their, their thought, their, their passion um, for this, and the drive to, to continue to make sure that spaces and places are more equitable um, really brings me joy and, and, and hope uh, for the future. Uh, and this work, you know, it, it, could be, it could be heavy, right? Um, and it, it manifests itself in physical ways too, both mental, physical, and just spiritual ways where you just you know, droopy eyelids, fatigued, tired, you know, um, everything's gray and dark, you know, but being able to see, um, the impact of the work and uh, being able to know that you're not alone in this work is it brings me joy um, professionally. Um, uh, personally, though, what brings me joy is, you know, when I, if I'm not at work, I'm with my kids. Um, so I will have friends calling my friends, what are you doing with my kids? Like I'm always with them at work or with my kids or it's, or it's both where they're in the office with me writing on the whiteboard. Um, but one of the things that recently brought me joy was um, my daughter asked me, so daddy, can you, can you be a monster and chase us? And then my son playing his switch stops and without taking a breath just says, fucking monsters in me. Dad's the slayer of monsters. Like he can't be a monster, he's a slayer of monsters. And so I'm like, wow, oh, that's crazy how he saw me, you know. But it brought it brought me joy in, in being able to just see the impact that I'm having with my own kids, but then also the students that I have that I'm working with um, here at the school as well. Awesome, Vincent. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Kevin Beckford, my role model, what brings you joy? So I, I, I sometimes feel like I'm like the doom and gloom guy. So <laughs> I, I apologize if I'm a little bit passionate around this stuff. And, but I have to tell you, um, my passion is tied to the joy that I feel in my heart because of the fact that I, um, I am intentional in what I do to, you know, try to create, create change, right? So... So I have to, you know, when I, when I look at fact, you know, when I put together, I am, um, I'm going to be in New York city, um, talking with the New York state, um, group of radiologists around, you know, how do we create change? And they asked me to put together my bio to send to them. And so every now and then I read, you know, you send your bio, but you don't always read it. Sometimes you're like, Oh boy. And, and I had updated it since I left the board. And I got to tell you, when I look at the boards that I sit on um, and the things that I'm doing, they really tie directly to my heart, you know, um, and, and, and so it doesn't feel like work to me. You know, it feels like, you know, using what time, talent and treasure I have to create change. And the thing I'm the most proudest of right now is that for the first time in a long time, long, long time, so long, I can't even remember when, probably over. 17 years, I actually have a therapist for me, just for me. And that therapist is like my coach. Um, and, um, and, and so every two weeks, like clockwork. In fact, I see my therapist more than I actually go to the gym because I haven't gone to the gym yet. April, don't kill me. I know you're gonna text me with that. <laughs> so I'll tell you in advance. So, and, and I'll tell you why, because it's so important to me to make sure that as you pour out, you need so, something to pour into you, right? And so for many, many years, I just focused on trying to do everything I can to make a difference in the world that I occupy and occupy. But I really wasn't focusing on me, and so I do now. So every two weeks, Rachel basically puts me on, what did you do, what you've been doing, did you write down? And so, and outside of that, you know, um, I, I'm as of this year on the Empire Justice Center board, 
And one of the things I'll be working with them on is around housing insecurity um, and legislation. Uh, so all the things I learned from being on the town board and how can we do that from a, uh, a New York State perspective. You know, as I mentioned earlier on the advisory um, uh, board for the anti-racism curriculum project, also to fulfill kind of on a cultural level for me, I'm on the executive board for the Rochester Jamaican organization to help set strategy moving forward for us. Uh, and also I'm the co-chair for the Levine Center Jan Haight, um, which is something I've been working with for the past probably four years. Um, and we're looking at how to really provide more education around how hate shows up in its many forms. Uh, and so we've gone from a executive director four years ago to where we now have five um, dedicated full-time people working on this effort. And we now have a dedicated um, education stream for young people um, that's being led by Thomas Collier, who's amazing. Um, and then from an art perspective, because I, I have an artistic part of my nature, I'm on the advisory council for the Memorial Art Gallery. Um, and so that's, so uh, when you look at some of the things that that's happening at MAG in terms of like some of the more cultural artistic work, new artists are bringing in. So that team of us is about 15 plus of us. The last four years have been working with Jonathan Binstock to improve um, diversity within not just the art, but also to make it more welcoming environment uh, for the community to be um, uh, at, at the MAG. So, so I, I feel a lot of joy because the things that I'm doing now feel much closer to who I am and how I feel. And then to make sure I don't go too crazy, um, my therapist helps to keep me on task in a way that makes sense. And then what's interesting, I think, is that I've gotten much better saying no. So when, I, when somebody asks me to do something, I ask what's their intention. If you want me to come in to do something and perform, something performative, move on. That's, I'm not your guy. You want me to come in to do something that's going to affect meaningful real change? I'll be there. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, I have hope. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, a quote from James Baldwin. He was asked this question back in the, in the 50s, you know, because he had finished saying some things that sounded horrible, like all the stuff that was going on back then, just like they're doing today. And Dick Cavett said to me, he says, are you optimistic? He says, I have to be. He says, because I'm alive. And if I wasn't optimistic, it means life is an academic thing. And what would be the purpose? And so I am optimistic, despite the fact that you hear me beating the drums for change. Um, it's because I'm 58 and I came to this country when I was 18. And I'm, I'm deeply disappointed with the lack of change that's occurred during my time here. And I know that before I die, and hopefully it'll be a long time before that happens. But the change won't be enough that I was hoping for. And mainly because there's too many people that we walk with every day, live with every day in our neighborhoods that don't know or don't care. I don't know which one, they get to choose that. I can't do anything about the care, but I can do something about the don't know. So educate, 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 and leave it to them to figure out what to do. But I am deeply optimistic about the future because I know what I'm doing with my cup and that makes me joyful. So Kevin is helping me segue into the last part of this. Um, we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present, we've done a little joy um, and then the next is the future. So Kevin has started us off with his hopes for the future. Um, so Kevin, you can either add more to it or we can move on to the next person. But um, if what you want in the future, what you think is important or any final thoughts that you wanna leave with us. Kevin, do you have anything else to add? Just to say thank you um, to the work you're doing here and just having this session. Um, I think if, if um, you know, my, my, what I suggested around maybe having a session dedicated to having the curriculum project come in and kind of teach a module and invite as many people um, and then just see where that sort of leads you. Um, that's what I hope for, for the future for Pittsburgh. And, uh, and I just hope that we remember to love each other. You know, it's, that's, that's the most powerful thing. It's, it allows for redemption to work. So, um, just take time out to love each other. That's all I would suggest. 
Thank you, Kevin. Vincent, you're up next, sir. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to say real quickly, um, Kevin Beck, I appreciate you bringing up Baldwin. I love Baldwin. I also love, too, how you kind of captured his cadence as well as you were quoting him. Um, that's you know, he's a very, very powerful guy. Um, but um, one of the things to just kind of like lasting words is continuously advocate, as it was mentioned by, by, by Keisha, advocate and continuously educate as well. Um, I like the idea of, of bringing the Ed Henry curriculum uh, uh, project and, and bring up a workshop maybe at the library, just kind of get uh, parents involved and communities involved because they don't know. And a lot of information that they are receiving on that um, is misinformation, um, misinformation. Um, and then they continuously perpetuate that with this information. So it's important that um, uh, you know, everyone is continuously educated on the, on the finer points of, of DI and anti-racism and continuously um, uh, being involved, right? Uh, coming to our, our, our board meetings, being part of um, different uh, panels of discussions to ensure that you have a perfect table so that your voice is heard. Um, again, I'm, I'm very optimistic, uh, just you know, in, 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 in turning this role, excuse me, um, and, and just seeing the work that was already done, um, and then just the community involvement. Again, to members on this call here as well, and just those that are not here as well, um, and just the students. Uh, again, this is a case where I'm very, very hopeful, uh, but continuously wanting to meet that same energy to ensure that um, as that, that ball goes up the proverbial hill, that it doesn't go backwards, right? You know, we can't go backwards. We've done a lot, even now, you know, this nationwide, you know, we, we have policy being put in place that are trying to turn back the hands of time, that are trying to turn back the work that has been done. So it's important that we continuously push forward and continuously educate and we continuously um, go up against Right, those people that that want to continue to oppress, that want to continue to silence um, the marginalized. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Keisha, what's your hope for the future, or any final thoughts? My hope is that we speak truth to fear. I think there's a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of misconceptions and. I think when we start to really, if we take a little bit of time to unpack what that fear actually is, um, we realize that it's maybe not rooted in reality. And I think it's, you know, speaking to obviously educating folks is <laughs> a big part of what I do, um, but also just making space for folks to just unpack you know, the things that are already exist um, within them, within their experiences. Um, so when I think about the future, it's, you know, continue educating, you know, but also um, leaning into that fear leaning into that fear because what we think is this big scary monster oftentimes isn't so i'll stop there thanks um and dr acock yes so some steps or something we can do for the future um i would say that they're on a on a state level they normally have sometimes some um public comments um and so right now the new york state office of mental health is having a community engagement feedback session. You can, you know, Google it on um, Office of Mental Health, New York State Office of Mental Health website. Um, please join, hear what they're trying to do, hear how it's going to affect our community, and then provide some feedback. We, we all need to hear the voices. The next session is March 2nd from one to three. The next one is March 7th from six to 8 p.m. So please, um, what I also would say is you're not alone please reach out to 988, talk to a therapist. We are relational people, no matter what. We like to be connected to people. And, you know, unfortunately through the COVID, we saw that go, um, we saw that not existing. Um, so please reach out to help. Help is there, you're not alone. And then lastly, I would like to leave you with, of course, I love James Bowen as well. So I'm going to leave you with a, a quote, which he says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So let's face things and let's face things together. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And then I just want to, in particular, just in case students decide to listen to this, I want to just reach out and say, you're not alone. You see me on this platform. You may see me in any, in any other area. <clears throat> Just know that I came from environments like you all. I also stand here with a learning disability and not the best family home environment. 
but I'm able to be where I'm at today. So please know that you're not alone. There are supports out there. Reach out and speak out. Thank you. So we wanted to just end with a quick optimistic closure for everyone who's here today, because our amazing panelists have, have shared wisdom and action and inspiration. Um, so each of you who are here today, just take a mo moment before you leave us and participate in the chat, you know, looking to the future based on what you learned, what you heard today, what you thought about how you're going to use your time, treasure and talent. Um, what's your next step after today, after the month of February? Um, share and, and we'll read um, the comments out loud in the chat. And um, thank you so much, panelists, for your time. You're amazing. Um, it was incredible, and we just we really appreciate it. Thank you so much.